Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. You are tuned into the final of our night photography week uh, webinars. You are here with me, Matt Dietrich from uh, Plane Wave Instruments, and you've joined us for behind the scenes with astrophotography equipment from Plane Wave Instruments. Today, Matt's going to be taking a look at astrophotography equipment that's produced for astrophotographers and astronomers around the world. So Matt, welcome back to the event space. Yeah, thanks, Derek. It's awesome. You guys put on a, a great show as always. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I think we're going to be taking a deeper dive than most of us are used to as it's concerning uh, night photography. So super excited to see what you have for us. I will remind everybody that Matt is going to be taking any questions that you guys have on any of the content we discussed today. So whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, live stream, feel free to get those questions and comments into the comment section there. And Matt, the show is yours. Awesome. Let's go ahead and share the screen here. Well, thanks again, guys, for joining us here. And I'd like to thank BH, obviously, for hosting this long week of awesome night sky and low light photography in general. It's gaining so much popularity. And it's amazing because considering I started playing with this stuff like 16 years ago with film. And of course, nothing turned out the way I expected with night sky photography with film. But a handful of years ago, I joined up one of the premier. Uh, astrophotography equipment manufacturer, certainly in the United States. And I have to be a little bit biased, but to say around the globe, just because we have such a passionate team of engineers and software developers to create some of the most advanced and user-friendly astrophotography equipment. So we'll dive right in. And with this talk, of course, I want to cover some of the equipment that we make, but to talk a little bit more about, well, who we are as a company and how do we help uh, astrophotographers and astronomers around the world accomplish some of the most difficult tasks by solving them with our equipment. So as a company, we were founded in 2006. And the main goal is essentially we wanted to create the perfect telescope. So this background photo is showing our brand new 50 seconds, 57 acre campus in Adrian, Michigan, which is where I'm broadcasting from right now. And we have all of our you know, optics, design, development, engineering, and our machining facility is just down the road as well. So the goal of Plane Wave as a whole, like I said, was to create the perfect telescope. And this talk, a lot of that is going to be about deep sky. And when I mean deep sky astrophotography, I mean uh, objects that are outside the solar system. So as a company, we don't just sell to the private amateur who wants to take pretty photos of a galaxy or a nebulae, but we sell to universities and government contractors. So it really spans the gamut of who we work with. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about working with Plane Wave is we get to work with everyone from private clients all the way through defense organizations and universities that are just doing groundbreaking work. So I think that's one of the fun parts about um, the company as a whole. And and a couple of the exciting projects uh, that Plane Wave has worked on over the years are shown here. And in the top left, it's our one of our brand new telescopes. And all of these telescopes um, are, can be combined with our direct drive mounts. And I'll kind of get into what that means in a bit. But uh, at the center of this shot is the one meter telescope. So when we talk about telescope sizes, I guess some nomenclature comes into play here. So a lot of times when telescopes start getting big, you start classifying them in meters, and that's the light collecting area of the mirrors or the optics themselves, whatever's collecting that light to create a photograph. So the one meter right now is our flagship. Uh, we have design uh, in progress for a two meter system, which is gonna be absolutely massive. And um, no one has a commercial off the shelf two meter telescope that's being produced right now. So we're trying to be uh, blazing the trail when it comes to that system, but we have smaller systems uh, that are a little bit easier to install, but the one meters are so simple to install as it is, and the images that you get uh, are incredible. So the goal with astrophotography and the equipment is, well, let's listen to our audience and figure out, well, as astrophotographers, and I've been an astrophotographer since 2005 or 2004 already. So 
when I learned about the hobby, you start running into issues, right? Okay, how do I track the night sky? Because, well, let's see, the earth is moving. <laughs> so you start running into all these issues and you start learning that, whoa, my equipment has limitations. And you start to really realize that when you go out to locations that have really good dark night skies, um, if you travel out west, um, if you travel down to super dark night skies, like in Utah or California has some really great skies or even down to remote locations like Chile or uh, Australia, you go to these locations and you start to realize that certain optics, whether it's just a camera lens on a tripod, you start to see limitations of what the optics can do uh, when you start to really pixel peep on some of those. But as a company, the goal is to create perfect optics for taking images on really, really big camera sensors. And we're talking full frame sensors and above because some of these camera sensors can be even medium format. So you're talking larger than that 24 by 36 uh, full frame sensor. And then with deep sky astrophotography, well, we need to keep the images pinpoint. You know, the stars are gonna wanna trail. So we need a stable platform to hold the telescope and stay locked on the same speed as the earth is turning to get quality, beautiful deep space astrophotos. And that's kind of what we started putting together. And I wanna talk a little bit more about, of course, just some of the equipment. So as a company, well, you know, how do we solve these challenges that astrophotographers face all around the world? I mean, it's, it's black magic creating optics that perform extremely well. And to go into that, back in the day, you know, plane wave was founded from actually a couple of Celestron engineers and Celestron was a telescope manufacturer and still is, and they make uh, incredible equipment, you know, for the amateur market, but two engineers, they wanted to create the perfect telescope. So they found a design that, well, of course, now is called the CDK. It's the corrected Dahl Kirkham. So it's just an optical design. All that means is you get perfect pinpoint stars all the way to the edge of the frame on your full frame sensor with a telescope. And many of you might know, if you zoom in on your astrophotographs, even if you're doing nightscapes, Hmm. Some of my stars look like these football shapes or they, they look like crosses. Crosses is from astigmatism. And then you start getting coma and chromatic aberration. All these crazy technical terms that just means that, hey, I have optical issues that my stars are not pinpoint on the edge of my 24 millimeter Rokinon lens. So the goal with this is to make a telescope that you have pinpoint stars all the way to the very edge. And with that telescope, ironically, the CDK is extremely user-friendly. The primary mirrors stay fixed in place, which means it's so easy to collimate the optics. And that just means pinpoint stars across the field of view and alignment. The alignments are very key. This is something that you know camera manufacturers for their lenses, they do. They, all their lenses are aligned and done. We don't really hear about that. But with a telescope, we do that at the factory. And then of course you ship it and you need to get on sky and start taking photographs and dial everything in goal with ours is they're so user-friendly that a lot of times, even with shipping, we shipped one all the way down to Chile. I didn't even need to adjust the optics. That's how stable and how quality the design can be. So also easy to produce. I think that's one of the biggest things with manufacturing on this side uh, is how quick can you produce a high quality uh, telescope? That's awesome, uh, one of the best benefits of our CDK design. So it's uh, using a spherical secondary mirror, uh, ellipsoidal uh, primary mirror, and then we have lenses. So we kind of have lenses as if you had contacts in or glasses that kind of do this final correction to give you beautiful images, uh, nice pinpoint. So that's one of the greatest uh, aspects. And the team that we have here at Planewave, we have quality engineers designing and technicians assembling all of these uh, telescopes. And I go around and I help put these telescopes together for clients in the field. So our in-house capability is kind of what really sets us apart um, from other companies because there's not many other people doing this on uh, on the planet, which is pretty special that you go from design of raw aluminum and uh, quartz glass, and you can put together all these components and make a high quality telescope 
to take beautiful images of the night sky. So the in-house capabilities that we offer kind of really helps us build the perfect telescope. And that's the goal. And a couple of these photographs show the behind the scenes of this is fused silica. This is quartz. This is like taking sand grains on a white pure beach. And eventually you heat up all those white sand grains and that's a few silica. And it turns into eventually you can make glass out of that. That's essentially what these mirrors are all made out of is glass, a few silica. And then we figure it and take it down. It takes hours and hours and hours to get it to the right shape. So we're putting in a certain shape into the glass and then eventually we coat the glass with aluminum and then we do an overcoat to make sure that it's protected and that gives the very, very high reflectance to the mirrors. And that's like the guts, those are the eyes of the telescope itself. And that's something that we all do in house to really keep, um, keep the quality as high as we can. So one of the key benefits, as I mentioned about this corrected Dahl Kirkham design, this one telescope on this slide is one of our 24 inches and it's on one of our L mounts that I'll talk about, but the, the user friendliness of the telescope is really what sets it apart. You know, we could be setting these up, we crane in the components and we could be on sky taking photographs that night, working with the astronomers or the astrophotographers. Um, a lot of that design really came into play with making sure that that telescope performs to the highest ability. So the ease of use and the ability to manufacture them quickly and have high performance, those are all the huge benefits of the CDK design. And of course, end all be all, we need beautiful star performance, like deep space astrophotographs. So some of this stuff, this little behind the scenes shot of one of these uh, emission nebulae is showing that all the way to the corner on this big sensor, our telescopes are gonna perform and show beautiful pinpoint stars. And that's a big camera sensor. This was um, one of the most famous camera sensors that just got discontinued, sadly. Maybe Sony, if Sony could step up and make, this is a, a 4K by 4K square sensor with nine micron pixels. Um, this was a CCD, it was a 16803, but now they stopped manufacturing them. But maybe Sony can step up and make some of those because it's the most popular sensor that people were using. And it's a beautiful big square sensors for taping, taking deep space astrophotographs, but just showing that of pinpoint stars to the very edge of that 16803 uh, CCD sensor. Um, a little bit of a comparison, you know, for, if any of you guys know, um, hear about other telescope designs and what kind of makes this one a little bit different. Well, the, there used to be a big rush for people to rush um, uh, image with Ritchie Creation telescopes and they're beautiful high focal length telescopes and great for galaxies and a lot of astrophotography. But that optical design is very difficult to manufacture and you're using hyperbolic mirrors, which are very kind of tight radiuses for the glass and that's the shape the light kind of comes back. But they have optical issues that the CDK doesn't, they kind of correct for. So that's the one um, trade-off that you kind of start looking at, but the CDK has kind of become the standard, you know, back 15, 20 years ago, the Ritchie Creation was the standard, but now with the CDK, it's kind of surpassed that just because how user-friendly they are and how stable the optics stay. That's one of the benefit. And just this little graph shows kind of, this is um, looking at spot diagram. It's just looking at a starlight coming in, um, estimating, kind of showing how much it spreads out from these optical issues. Like we said, like, if you image with your wide angle lens, you have like coma and astigmatism and all those issues that you look at the very corners. That's where you look at performance of optics is the corners of them. So it's kind of fun to do with your lenses um, if you do a lot of nightscape shooting, which is something I like to shoot a lot of as well. Um, the optics, that's just one piece of the puzzle, but the software technology, I mean, it's Kevin Iverson is our main software engineer and he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And it's always funny when I just like sit and I look at him, like just gazing when he tells stories about how all these things go together for software development is to me, it's another black magic of coding to make something work, but he taught himself how to write for motor tuning. And that's one thing I'll mention about is that's for our mounts to track extremely well. We use actually motors to do that. And this software that Kevin wrote is PWI4, this plane wave interface four. And that's one piece of the puzzle that we have an in-house software engineer that works directly with our engineers to make sure that we can communicate well with the equipment and just adds to that ease of use and user friendliness. So that controls the motors in our mounts that are gonna slew around and I'll show you what those look like. He wrote this awesome software to allow uh, clients to tune the mounts and that makes the tracking performance uh, leaps and bounds 
over a geared mount, a traditional like little sky watcher mount. All that's in that are these little gears that are kind of meshing together in a direct drive mount. Those are gone. So we have um, those kind of in-house capabilities, which is pretty cool because it makes the mount so fun to use. And that's what, of course, allows the telescopes to perform to the highest capability. In this graph, I know it, it might not look like much to folks, but looking down here at these green lines, axis zero and axis one, these are our altitude and, and azimuth uh, motors on the mount. It's kind of tracking with the night sky and it's fractions of an arc second of air. And all that means is crazy stability over long terms for keeping stars pinpoint because there's no gears meshing together. So it's funny putting that in because I'll put that up on Instagram and people will just, you know, frowny face at me because their geared mounts are usually one to two arc seconds plus of, of, of tracking air, which all that means is you have to auto guide and you have to do a lot more, uh, pay attention to the mounts more and pull or align it well. But the software and the mount technology really allows for high stability in tracking. That auto tuner is a really cool thing, like I said, that Kevin wrote, and it allows the mounts to be optimized for tracking. And that's all within the software that, that clients can run with and optimize their setup. So this is one little video I had, but you can always check out our plane wave YouTube for kind of behind the scenes on it, but it'll show the whole tuning process. It's pretty amazing because when you send electricity to these mounts, it actually will start, the mount can start singing once you get up to these certain frequencies as you tune. And all that does is give you kind of the craziest tracking performance, but we'll kind of skip that video at least. And you guys can check that out on, on our YouTube channel if you're interested. But looking at some of the tracking errors and the pointing accuracy, these this model is after we kind of pinpoint images in the night sky, the polar alignment is key, right? We go out there, say, with our little Skywatcher mounts, and if I'm using a little 14 millimeter lens, I literally can just pick up my Skywatcher and I can aim it roughly north if I'm in the northern hemisphere. You can't do that with a system that has a 4,000 millimeter focal length, you know, not a 14 millimeter where it's wide angle and you really don't see the tracking issues even in like a 25 second shot. With, with those high focal lengths of the telescopes, you really need to have high quality tracking and polar alignment. And our equipment allows that to happen. So that's one of the cool things, just highlighting the polar alignment error that the software helps dial in, and then the pointing error. So we can point to different targets in the night sky, fractions of a width of another star. So that's kind of the tracking and pointing. If you want to find a tiny galaxy, our equipment easily can do that. Of course, it's, it's kind of... Um, common nowadays but here's a video of some of the mount performance and this is going to show the speed that the direct drive mounts have and that's what we manufacture in-house kind of shows eventually that top left video you'll see this mount whipping the telescope around that's a 20 inch telescope that's sitting on this mount and all said and done that system weighs about 400 pounds um, thereabouts with once you load it out with cameras but this is just doing a quick pointing model. So basically the telescope slews and it'll take an image through the camera and then it goes to this database and it says, hey, I need to fingerprint this to see where I'm actually pointing. So that's one area of the night sky that this camera on the telescope is gonna keep imaging. And then you get the high tracking point, uh, high tracking and high pointing precision through that mount model. And uh, the pointing precision is key for when you're trying to locate a tiny, tiny galaxy or a planetary nebula in the night sky, you need to have high quality tracking. So it's kind of crazy how these things can move around quickly, but that's the benefit of um, the direct drive mounts. Also tied in is control for using the software of our focuser and our rotator. So you just like you rack the focuser out on your camera lens, well, your astrophotography camera goes on the back of the telescope and our software can automatically go through and give you a focusing V curve. And that V curve kind of dials in the sweet spot. So imagine, you know, instead of manually having to do that with a wide angle lens, the telescope does that automatically with our software that Kevin wrote. So it's pretty intuitive, easy to use, and it all integrates pretty well well. So jumping in to all those little pieces of software kind of add up and culminate into, well, we have mounts and these mounts are what track the night sky. And these are a few photos on the side showing the direct drive mounts that we manufacture. We wind all these little cop copper coils and we have rare earth element magnets. And basically you just have a bearing and you send electricity to the mount and it zips around because there's no gears to move. So we do all that and it allows us to track satellites. We can track the space station super easily. 
Uh, and the slew speeds are pretty funny and they're, and they're virtually silent because there's no gears to make noise and kind of whine like typical gears will make when they're moving. And, uh, it's just super fun, especially trying to track satellites in the space station. It's so easy to do with our equipment because of the direct drive motor technology. And um, this one system, so now I'm kind of getting into what we're actually manufacturing on the product side of things. The L350 mount is the smallest mount that we make. It can carry 100 pounds. And on this one in this photograph is a 14-inch telescope, a beautiful system to run. And I even had this in one of my YouTube videos that we posted uh, in our driveway. You know, you can roll this out on a rolling pier cart and do that little pointing model and start taking some beautiful deep space astrophotographs. Or in the one case, we just did a live video and tracked the space station, which is pretty cool. Uh, last May when the first SpaceX um, crew uh, Dragon capsule docked with uh, the space station. And behind the scenes, this is kind of the, the shot you can get with that 14 inch telescope. You can get the crazy, beautiful hydrogen alpha. That's that red. That's an emission nebula in this whirlpool galaxy, just crazy deep space astrophotographs. That's one of our clients. Kevin Moorefield stuff is just epic. Go check him out on Instagram because his stuff is wild. Um, and he shoots with that CDK 14 telescope and then that L350 mount. It's just a beautiful setup. Uh, performance wise, again, this is going back to showing just that edge of the camera sensors, looking at it, showing that these stars are pinpoint to the very edge, which as we've shown, it's very difficult to do with optics, especially bigger optics. And you want to make sure you're holding the glass right and not causing any stress on it. And that all really comes into play. So it's one of the top things that the plane wave telescopes offer stepping up in size, the L500 direct drive mount that we have can hold an even bigger telescope. Case in point, this one was in Saint-Tropez, France, that I never even heard of this area. And maybe some of you might laugh, but I wasn't up to speed on pop culture stuff or knowing that Saint-Tropez, France is one of these very high-end luxury areas. But this client built an observatory on top of one of his villas and this, the roof would slide back. So this pier would actually raise and lower on linear actuators, which is crazy. So the telescope would raise up and then would start imaging the night sky. He did a lot of research, but our mounts are very capable of doing the research he was doing, which was looking at exoplanets. So another planet uh, going in front of a star. So it comes in and it blocks light, and which is really cool. It's, it's just basically like an eclipse on another planet. Um, looking for different planets that orbit other stars. He does a lot of that kind of research from, uh, from France, but also from Chile, where we just installed another system for him. So you get up in size, bigger telescopes can collect more light. Case in point, this one was from a CDK-20, one of our 20-inch telescopes. So it's a, a half meter in diameter, that piece of glass, the primary mirror. And um, this galaxy was M33 triangulum, just beautiful, captured by one of our other clients, Jeff Loveless. His stuff is crazy. He was even shortlisted for Astrophotographer of the Year. And there's still, that's the announcements will come later, but one of his photographs, um, those are the kind of quality of the images that you can get out of these systems. These people are winning contests left and right. They're getting NASA A pods left and right. And um, it's just crazy cool to see that they're using all of our equipment. It's, it's really special to see once you do all the uh, behind the scenes and you build this equipment. And, you know, with this last L mount, this is the L mount because they kind of look like the shape of an L, but it can hold up to our 24 inch telescope, which is crazy cool because it soaks up so much light in a short amount of time. And of course, with astrophotography, you want to capture as much light as possible. And you're going to be able to image fainter galaxies and nebulae and distant star clusters. It's it's something special, but the direct drive mounts as well with that CDK24 turns it in such a beautiful package to image. And this was one of the ones that we went down to Chile for back in uh, fall. Uh, well, it would have been their fall, but it was in uh, February for us that we went down and set up this CDK24. And this is kind of our little marketing system down at Obstec in Chile. So amazing host facility, best guys on, on the planet and at least the infrastructure too. They got fiber optic internet and it's so easy. I literally can sit here and like control the telescope with my phone, which is kind of crazy cool and just tell it to image. So I photographed the Sombrero galaxy and uh, with that system. So it's just uh, wild, the amount of detail you can get. And that's ironically for any of you Sony shooters, that Sony a seven uh, or what is it? Uh, R4. That one is the same sensor that this special astronomy camera is using. So that same 61 megapixel camera is just crazy um, for deep space astrophotography. 
stepping up in size, we have a CDK 700, which is even larger. And it has this tight form factor and an alt as package. So it's beautiful for satellite tracking and research. And it's perfect for uh, public observatories because people in wheelchairs can go up right to the side and view through an eyepiece. So that's one of the benefits of this Naismith optical design that it allows you to view uh, through the side port. It kind of directs the light out and makes it easier for public observing. And then you can switch over to a camera camera and take photos all within like 10 seconds. You can flip between a camera to an eyepiece, uh, you know, for public observing or imaging. This is one of the newest products that we just announced and sold multiple systems for already by word of mouth was this Richie Creation uh, RC 700. And it's amazing, high focal length. It's 8,400 millimeter focal length. So very, very high magnification for imaging distant galaxies, but also for tracking satellites is one of the big things that is kind of up and coming now. People want to observe satellites and they also want to downlink data from a satellite down to the earth with a laser and a infrared laser light. They can, uh, or actually it's like five uh, in the 500 nanometer range that they can downlink this laser light and observe and uh, collect that light and that's transmitting data. So it's basically fiber optic internet, take apart the fiber, you're doing it through, uh, from, uh, through the atmosphere. It was just crazy. It's called free space optical communication, but it allows high data rates to be transmitted and it's very secure because it's going from literally a satellite down to say a telescope. So people can't like hack into that light per se, but that's one of the crazy cool systems we just, um, we just started producing and just installed one uh, for NASA. Uh, at Goddard, which is pretty cool. This satellite tracking stuff, this is a factory acceptance test that we did for NASA. So coming into field of view here is the space station. So in the top right, you're going to see the space station a little bit overexposed, but you can see that the solar panels will come down a little bit. That's at that 8,400 millimeter focal length. So you can see the software technology that we have. That's how powerful uh, our team is in general, from design to engineering to software side. Like our software engineer made that software so you literally drag and click and can recenter the space station at 8,400 millimeter focal length. That's a crazy magnification. So, and then you can see the mount kind of does this unwrapping and eventually will re catch up on the space station. But that's um, this wide field view on the left is the space station. You can see the stars coming by. And what he'll do is he'll slide and jog the telescope around to recenter the space station. So, that's one of the coolest things I've ever seen um, from our software engineer, Kevin. It's just, um, one of the coolest um, imaging sessions I've ever seen us do. So that's awesome for satellite tracking. And that's the benefit of direct drive because we can easily track um, space station like that this is pretty cool. Biggest one right now that we produce is the one meter. So the one meter is that case in point, it's about a 39 uh, it, mirror diameter inch mirror, which is crazy. So nearly a 40 inch diameter mirror, it weighs about 130 pounds. That's the primary light collecting area of that one meter telescope. And we've sold these for astrophotographers around the world for uh, government agencies and universities uh, all over. So it's such a fun system to install because we had to crane in all the components but it's just ridiculous because you collect so much light so quick. So some of the images that you can get out of these uh, one meter systems are just crazy. So we'll show that down the line at the end, but um, starting out with a smaller telescope, some of the images that you can get, this one was from Kevin Moorfield again, that he photographed. Um, it's the pillars of creation. That's that Hubble uh, region that made very famous by that deep space shot that Hubble captured. So um, of that beautiful uh, nebulae, just incredible. The, the pillars of the gas and dust there on the right hand side. This was one that was shot through a CDK 14, which the noise is so clean because he stacked so many images and, you know, transitioning into this one was a CDK 17 through the Horsehead Nebula. A lot of you guys know in the belt of Orion, there's beautiful Horsehead Nebula there. That's dark nebula that just has this crazy structure. that looks like a horse's head. And um, that was captured by a couple of our, um, clients here, uh, Mark Hansen and Martin Pugh, just ridiculous detail and structure uh, that they got out of it just because the optics are so sharp. CDK 20, that's step up, and this is going through the heart, imaging kind of the heart of the Rosette Nebula, just beautiful. He did, Don Goldman shot this narrowband image to so kind of cut through a lot of the haze and any light pollution, but it gives you this different color effect in the different palette. You know, you can image and kind of change up uh, colors and see different structures in the nebulae, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, the other one I love, <laughs> the CDK24, it's probably one of my favorite scopes that we make because the price target and then how much aperture you get for collecting these faint targets. This one's a planetary nebula, but Mark Hansen and Stan Watson shot this one. It's just ridiculous. Like the detail that they get out of that planetary nebula. So the star got really, really old and it started to expand and it gave off all these layers and shells of gas and dust into space. And of course, the telescope can pick that up in long exposure, which is just crazy. The CDK 700 is another cool one for imaging different targets, uh, even, of course, planets. You get high focal length, so you can get more detail out of Jupiter and Saturn. That's, that was from NERIT. Uh, NERIT was the uh, National uh, Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand. And, uh, that's just a, a great facility and a lot of smart folks there doing research. And, of course, once in a while, they take some, some photographs to send us and share, which is cool. And then this one, it's absolutely crazy because it's data from the one meter telescope that we have down at Obstec in Chile, which case in point is just, it's one of my favorite places to install telescopes and the staff there, they, they have so many plane wave uh, instrument scopes down there as it is. It's kind of like plane wave South, a uh, special place to observe the night sky in Chile at the Southern edge of the Atacama desert. And, um, you know, they're professional astronomers that own that company. So it's pretty cool that you can collaborate with them if you guys, you know, people can rent spots uh, and send telescopes down there, anyone, and just image galaxies and nebulae and just these amazing crisp night skies. So there's kind of like a gold rush that people are sending scopes to Obstec left and right in Chile. And, um, you know, we've sent a lot of scopes down there and we installed the one meter down there in, in February. And this is one of the galaxies that... Um, Mike Selby, our client there, uh, captured so far. He's pumping out crazy data. And um, that's kind of one of the fun things. And, and I help run a lot of the installations. So people want training on how to set up this equipment. So we go around and we work with them hand in hand to help them accomplish their goals. You know, that's the biggest thing I think that's working with clients is listen to what they want to do and help match them up with the right equipment so they can kind of push the boundaries. And that's one of the best, best things that we have going um, with a lot of the clients that are so passionate. So when we're in the field, I always try to capture behind the scenes moments and share them on our YouTube and, and also on my Instagram and that sort of thing as well. So you guys can follow along and check out our installations in our own YouTube for kind of some of these cool behind the scenes videos that cover all this equipment. So you can check us out. That's our plain wave YouTube account. And, you know, some of the behind the scenes stuff I like capturing, are, of course, these, these candid shots that the storytelling side of the behind the scenes of setting up these telescopes for people, um, it's humbling, it's exhausting at the same time, because sometimes you're doing 18 to 20 hour days to get the equipment set up and running, uh, dialed in, and you're, you're fighting the weather sometimes. But in Chile, uh, they got 300 clear nights a year. So odds are that when you're down there, you're going to be able to observe the night sky and, and observe the Milky Way uh, with the Milky Way going overhead. It, it's so different down there in the Southern Hemisphere. But uh, in 2021 this year, some of the most notable ones were installing down at Obstec in Chile, this one meter, and then we had two CDK 600 systems and that image on the bottom right. It's hard to see it, but you notice on the far right is one of our telescopes. It's a CDK24 that we set up for kind of our marketing and imaging session stuff. I only put one camera on that telescope and it's kind of extended off the back end. And that's that QHY camera, which is just using the Sony uh, A7R4 sensor. But the client uh, on that other one, he literally had a system that had over 12 cameras. <laughs> so we had it set up with one massive camera on the side and we use a what's called an instrument selector. So we have the capability at plane wave to really go way beyond kind of standard one camera setups to literally his system has over 12 cameras on it. Uh, he wants to do that planetary research, the exoplanets, uh, high resolution planet shots. He wants to do deep space as well. So we turn his system into this super flexible package uh, that was just crazy. The guys, um, that's that same system in France, but we put one down for him in, in Chile at Obstec for him. So that was one of the funnest installs. And I was down there for two weeks just because of the COVID protocol that you have to stay in that country for um, over 10 days before you can exit again. And then uh, that was back in February and March. Uh, another one was at Palomar. This is, you know, I, I should have looked forward to this one even more because I really didn't um, realize how special this install was going to be because they haven't installed a new telescope at Palomar Observatory, which has such a historic background with the Hale 200 inch telescope. That's a five meter telescope, like the glass. The primary mirror is over five meters in diameter. 
it's it's the size it's bigger than a house like the whole telescope in that dome in that top photograph you see the plane waves telescope in the small dome but then in the background is the hail the 200 inch telescope such a historic site and passionate people and astrophotographers and astronomers around the world of course know that site and facility outside san diego um, it's just humbling that plane wave that we could be a part of that kind of install and to continue that heritage of astronomy from Palomar. So definitely one of the coolest, most famous ones. I think that um, we're definitely going to do this year and to touch base on, I guess, some of the coolest stuff. We also did a, a Delta Rho. This is our upcoming Delta Rho 350. It's just shy of a 14 inch aperture, but it's F3 and it's a thousand fifty millimeter focal length. So it's wide field and it soaks up so much light. So I literally shot these images from McDonald Observatory in Texas in the Lagoon Nebula on the top right, six minutes, just six minutes. What normally would be a like dozens of hours to get these deep images with a fast focal ratio, just like shooting with like an F1.4 lens for nightscapes. You can do that with telescopes. And usually F3 is like a sweet spot and it's soaking up so much light, but that's coming soon. So it's something that you guys don't want to miss out because even just these images in the vlog that we put together from that workshop with this telescope is going to be, it's, it's over the moon, like what we're seeing already through some of these photos. And that's something that you won't want to miss out on. So stay tuned for that upcoming telescope. We're going to be announcing it here pretty soon. And it's just, uh, it's a special system. And for me, loving wide field imaging, that is where I'm passionate about for my astrophotography. And um, finally, we have that product coming. And then another thing with that telescope down in Chile is if you guys want to edit some of the craziest deep space astrophotograph photograph data, that one meter is going to be pumping out data subscriptions. So stay tuned. And if you can, you can quickly scan that QR code and it's going to take you to our plane wave newsletter. So that's going to let you sign up for the newsletter so you guys can join and stay tuned for whenever we go ahead and submit that data for everyone to start editing and it's crazy because it, on the right hand side you can see that's a sombrero galaxy it looks like it was shot with hubble i mean it but it was shot with a one meter from obstech there uh it, so it's going to be crazy to start pumping out data for folks to edit all over the world so you don't want to miss out for that kind of stuff you want to subscribe because there is no subscription like this on the planet for a one meter telescope it's it's something I can't wait to get up and running in live and it's going to be pretty soon. So I hope you guys go ahead and uh, scan that QR code and join and stay tuned for that. Well, I appreciate it guys. Um, I have a few photos of just kind of some of my astrophotography, but um, I know it's kind of a lot of technical information, but I kind of hope it shows that the resulting images from plane wave instruments, telescopes that we're pumping out in the mounts really help make something special for astrophotographers and researchers all over the planet. So, you know, with me, my passion, I got into this because I was doing, you know, nightscape imaging in a lot of deep space. So some of my stuff was just camera lens and and small telescope work. And then, uh, you know, I really wanted to apply that. And so I joined plane wave in 2018 and it's just been the best career that I've ever had. That just want to stay with a company because we're pushing the boundaries. So it's special to work for a company like that and work for folks that are just, um, you know, high quality engineers and talented to kind of accomplish the same goal of making the perfect telescope. So, I mean, the next couple shots are just a few of the nightscapes kind of imaging that I like to do um, in my spare time. And this one was just kind of a panorama from Chile. Um, case in point, again, some of the most crazy dark skies down there, the Milky Way arcing in the crazy air glow in the zodiacal light on the right hand side. Um, wild night skies in Chile. Uh, I try pushing the boundaries with some of the nightscape shooting. <laughs> you could shoot the Milky Way from a plane. This was one from uh, the airplane when we were flying back from Chile um, not too long ago. So it's kind of cool to get the Milky Way setting uh, over the Atlantic Ocean, which is kind of cool. And then another one from Obstech, just showing the experience of being under the night skies with our equipment is, is something special. You get that Milky Way in the zodiacal light, from Obstec in Chile, it's um, it's a beautiful sight. And then, of course, even here in the United States, of course, you have awesome night skies in national parks out west to explore. So I hope you guys, um, you know, get inspired to to continue your tradition of stargazing and sharing images of the night sky, and um, and keep your heads up, of course, and share your images to help inspire the next generation. So thank you guys for watching, and hope um, inspires you guys to to get outside and enjoy the night sky. Well, Matt, thank you so much, man. Uh, I'm going to jump right into the questions here because it's just super interesting 
content. And like I had prefaced the presentation <laughs> with, you went really, really beyond literally and physically beyond a lot what of you know, a lot of what we see in astrophotography it's like everybody's just like okay stars and milky way and it's like you're getting into those shots of the nebula and i my question you know is at what point do you have to when is it you know when do you stop buying a super telephoto lens and yeah. move up to something a little stronger a little more powerful no that's a great question derek and it's funny because like i said you'll start you'll start finding the limits of your equipment when you start imaging. And the tricky thing with telephoto lenses is the optical quality just isn't designed for pinpoint. Like we call them, you know, uh, point sources, like a star is just a point source. So the optics have a hard time correcting it. And I'm not saying, you know, go spend $50,000 because you want to learn your equipment and then move up and then grow into it. So, but the telescopes are designed to, to correct pinpoint stars. And that's, one of the big things at plane wave, that's what we take seriously. So nothing leaves a factory until it meets our specs. So, um, you know, work with telephoto lenses, but you can grow into deep space and people are doing that. You know, we do workshops with that stuff with like little 61 millimeter refractors that people are using on sky watchers. Right. So their portability is there now. And then now people want to grow like these, these workshop students want to add in higher focal length to do more magnification. So, you know, the 200 millimeter lenses are great to, to learn with, but the trackers start to become a limiting factor because you'll get stars trailing pretty quick, uh, maybe only a couple minutes if it's polar aligned well. Hmm. And then depending on the optics you're using, that could be even, you know, if you're using optics that aren't the, the greatest you're running yeah. into those problems even easier. Yeah. And then it might, you might have like those, you might have to stop the lens down, you know, as in like take it from the F 1.4 down or whatever. If you're using a 200 millimeter lens, usually those are, you might be able to get F 2.8, but can you imagine how expensive that lens is going to be, you know, but then you might have the coma in like these football shaped stars on the edges. So a lot of times they're just not designed to, to image stars that well, but you could take crazy good shots, you know, with lenses. And I love the portability of them. Like, you know, 135 millimeter lenses in Milky Way, little mosaics, the detail scary, like with Sony G master glass I've shot with in the Sony, it's kind of scary what you can do from dark skies. Now, speaking of Sony, uh, Nihar is joining us here on zooms asking, what is your thoughts on modifying a Sony a seven three to start as a beginner and then later buying a specific Astro camera? Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, we work with, um, Spencer's camera. They're one of our plane wave resellers. They do the modifications and, um, I've been shooting with one of their modified a seven S three. So it's the 12 megapixel full frame. And that's a great one to modify because it doesn't have that little uh, infrared light leak. Some of the Sony's, if you modify them, you modify to let in this, this red wavelength, like this beautiful emission nebulae. Um, but some cameras you can modify well and some you can't, but a couple of the Sony's have issues. Um, but just reach out to Spencer's camera because they'll let you know, you know, which one modifies well. But absolutely, I always started with DSLR and then, you know, now the mirrorless are out. So save money and learn the technique, learn how to stack the photographs and DSLRs and mirrorless are the way to do that. And they're portable. I mean, look, you don't need hundreds of pounds of equipment to start out because then we get frustrated and, you know, discouraged. So the Sony lenses are great or just um, shoot me an email as well. If you got questions, like check out my Instagram and just let me know if you got questions, I'll, I'll help as much as I can. Perfect. And Matt Nihar had a follow-up on a prime telephoto lens, Sony lens or a small telescope that you recommend to start with. I have shot, like, if you want to do like this deep space stuff and try, um, I mean, I have for wide field, I got the Sony 24 millimeter one four. I mean, it's crazy sharp. It's $1,400, but you get what you pay for with optics, with astrophotography. But I've used Sony's 85 millimeter uh, one. I think it's one eight maybe, or maybe that's still one four, but then there's the 135 G master. And the, it's crazy cool to shoot with those focal lengths, because if you have good polar alignment, that kind of keeps the stars tight and pinpoint, but those three lenses are great. It's, um, they're expensive, but it's worth the investment and they're going to hold their value. So it's not like you just walk off the car lot and already lost like half the value. It's good glass. You know, you won't, you won't be upset by using Sony glass at all. Now, Matt, what's the difference or if there is a difference when we're talking these, you know, high power telescopes and such in how, you know, you have a, a lens manufacturer say, say you have, you know, like your Canon, your Sony, your Nikon, your Sigma, 
making regular glass for a mirrorless camera or a DSLR, is it a similar process as far as you guys are looking obviously way further into the galaxy? There's more light interference. There's more, you know, in the way of aberrations and, and comb aberrations and chromatic aberrations that you have to worry about. Is it a similar process as far as the manufacturing of the lens? Yeah. And especially like, I th did you ask about like fixed focal length or are you talking about just in general, even telephoto, uh, you know, for variable zoom kind of stuff? Yeah, either. Okay. So like the tricky thing with a variable zoom is you have so many lens elements, right. That are kind of moving all trying to perform and give you like an optimal sharpness to your image. Right. So fixed focal length, like a, your, your one thirty fives, these primes are always going to be sharper because they're going to use less glass and you have less moving parts and components to shift. Cause it's kind of, they always have to find a sweet spot. And, you know, we don't, we don't manufacture lenses here per se, but we do utilize lenses in our telescopes to do the final correcting. Like we said, like with contacts in glasses, those are just pieces of glass, they're lenses to curve the light the way we want to. So they're a nice pinpoint, but, um, it's, they're tricky to manufacture and perform, but primes will always perform usually sharper for astrophotography, but sometimes you want to stop them down. Uh, if you have a one, four, I, I like to shoot wide open because I want so much light, but um, it becomes more expensive to make high quality edge performance for those pieces of glass. It's um, it's the scalability with production and all that fun stuff. But um, I think that's the biggest thing you learn what your equipment can do, and then you can kind of invest in others and try it. And of course, um, you know, B&H, that's all the gear. You can always go to them. That's the key. Check out all these, these lenses they have. And, um, and you can always check out their used department. That's a key to save money as well and figure out what works well for your needs. And of course, B&H has all that stuff there. Definitely. Now, is there a resource as far as renting telescopes? I know that's a, a popular thing with people to do before you buy mm -hmm. a lens, you rent it out for a week or two. Is there a similar resource with Th that's one of, I think one of the big things I made the plug at the end about like the data subscriptions, because not many people have access to like a one meter plane wave telescope. So that's something that is special that people will subscribe to the data because that's a half million dollar telescope and you need an observatory and a location to house it. So the initial investment is expensive to build an observatory, but you don't need to go over the moon and build something like that. Even though we did one guy, we sold down to Obstech. He was his first telescope and it, he bought a one meter because he wanted something that was just going to give him the best images. So that kind of stuff happens, but um, to rent telescopes, you can do telescope rental time. Um, you, there's different facilities you can do that on, which is kind of cool. Um, ones like I telescopes, um, there's a few other ones you can buy data subscriptions, but that's one thing, you know, if you stay tuned for our plane wave stuff, we're going to be putting out the subscription. So people don't have to invest in the gear. They can just see the quality of the data as they edit. And then of course, you know, if they want to invest on the line, you can always look into buying equipment, but um, I telescopes, you can get like scope time or telescope live. I think there's a few of these ones that you can log in different telescopes around the world and do astrophotography. So that's a way to, to dabble in, you know, non-plane wave equipment. They might have like Takahashi and other telescope brands that you can check out um, and, and image with as well. Wonderful. I can't wait to tell my wife and my landlord that I'm ripping a hole in the roof of my apartment to <laughs> uh, put an observatory. Yeah. In. Yeah. I think you guys just do some cool star parties and stuff like that and share, mm -hmm. share the night sky with people. Cause it's, yeah. it's crazy. Everyone geeks out on this stuff. I think that's what the fun, fun aspect is the most, you know, you're so passionate about it. Yeah, I mean, you look at like the the images, like like the horse said, and yeah. it takes it to just another level. I mean, I think we've all, with taking pictures of the moon, if you get one picture of the moon, unless you really put something in the foreground or you yeah. have some kind of interesting composition, it's always just going to be a moonshot. But once you get into those shots of the nebula, yeah, it's super interesting. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't have to be like keep it. I think the biggest thing I've learned over the years doing this is keep it simple. Like with any hobby or anything in life, tried it's so difficult because I wanted to jump into the deep end. I didn't even try wide field when I was young. I literally went to film camera, stick it on a telescope, and see if it works. And of course, nothing turned out. But then you get this bug of you get addicted to learning something that's so different that not many people are doing. But Night sky photography has grown so much since then. And we have these digital cameras now that you can instantly have results and see if something is number one, is it even in focus with film? I couldn't tell that until I went and got it developed. You know, it's kind of crazy how um, we have good technology now to get into the hobby inexpensively for, you know, a few hundred bucks, you can get some equipment used and, um, and get shooting the night sky and inspiring the next generation to stargaze. I think that's the power that we have to share 
with the photography. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, and it's a crossover between, you know, being able to just view it and taking it to another level and capturing these yeah. images and, and being able to hold on to them. And along those lines, is it something that is, is it an easy crossover between, you know, hooking up a camera to a telescope and, and getting images like this? Is there, what's it like for somebody like me who's never put yeah. the two together? It's, I mean, w- number one, when it comes to that kind of stuff, we can always help it plane wave. Cause that's one thing it's every telescope. So your camera and lens already has what's called like a back focus, right? Like the camera manufacturer made it. So your lens already has the certain distances to reach focus. Cause you know, sometimes you can't just take a, any camera and then just stick it on randomly a telescope without, you have to kind of calculate the right adapters mm. to reach the focus. So, but you know, all the telescope manufacturers and all that, they're there to help. And just like us at Plane Wave, we're here to help to make sure that depending on what camera you use, we can make sure that we get it to the right focus. Cause that's, that's something that of course, you know, Nikon and all the big brands, it's all done so you can interchange lenses and reach focus. So that's one thing that you learn when you kind of get into the telescope side of things that telescopes all have their different, what's called back focus. It's just what, what, where the, the cone of light comes out and reaches focus. Okay. That makes a little more sense now. I figured I'm like, I don't know if I'm way out of my league here or. <laughs> yeah. It's fun putting stuff together, but it's, it becomes like rinse and repeat. Like you make little mm-hmm. spreadsheets and it just says, Hey, I need, we have all the adapters on the shelf. Right. So we know the part numbers and the distances and, you know, certain cameras like these QHYs and ZWOs that are all, they're all using Sony sensors. Right. right. So they're all crazy high uh, performance sensors. And, you know, you just do the distances and most clients start running with the same systems, right? They, they get what co- common cameras are available, which is kind of cool. So it, um, it becomes pretty easy once you do it a few times, but if you got questions, we're always here to help. It's, it's good that I now know somebody in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To reach out. It's like, we get people always texting and stuff like that, but it's like they, they become friends. That's the fun thing. All these install people you go work for, they uh-huh. uh, will text them and just, you know, always chat and astro or other stuff that's going on they become lifelong friends i think that's yeah i didn't expect that when i started that but you realize when you do what 15 20 hour days with people like you build those bonds pretty quick and uh it's pretty fun it makes it special no i mean you could definitely see your passion and you know your your love for what you do your yeah. love for the company you work for so it's, it's awesome uh yeah. a- amy's asking if you're excited about the perseid meteor shower tonight <laughs> see that's it was so well it, it stormed through here in michigan last night and it clouded up but you know it's if you guys can get to dark skies do it you know i of course i don't think i'm going to shoot it tonight just with everything going on with work and stuff but um, if you can get to dark skies, that's always a key. And of course the moon phase is prime for it too. We're not dealing with a full moon. So, but it's always usually, uh, right before dawn, you know, you can still see some the next handful of days, but usually it peaks right before dawn. That's kind of when the earth goes through all the debris from the comet and it gets, you start getting as many meteor counts as you can. So I wonder, but from Mount Rainier back in 2015, that was when I was like the best that I got to shot and, and see it. That was my one and only eight pod, eight pod was from that kind of event. But it, we had like 300 meteors in a few hours. It was one after the other because it was no moon and there was uh, no light pollution. It was crazy. Awesome. Yeah. Now, Matt, I'm going to ask you if you could throw your information up there again. I want to make sure people can uh, reach out, th- throw you a follow on Instagram. Yeah, and uh, if this. anybody has any information, um, Nihar, yeah, I know you're watching out there, Nihar, a huge... Uh, Thank you to all of you guys for watching and you're yep. welcome. This is the, the content we love to put on. So we had some people thanking yeah. us for this week of night photography stuff. So I, I want to thank Matt. I want to thank uh, everybody at Plain Wave Instruments for sponsoring today's event and the rest of our speakers who have already spoken this week and to all of our viewers have tuned in this week. So there you guys have it. Uh, Planewave.com, Instagram.com at Plain Wave Instruments. Uh, and if you just go on YouTube and type in plane wave instruments. You'll yep. pull up the, uh, the plane wave media channel there. Um, so if you guys do have any lingering questions, Matt has made himself available. Feel free to, to reach out and uh, talk to the experts. <laughs> don't, don't consult the internet. Go right to the expert. <laughs> yeah. this, that's what, that's what we have here. We're the, here to the help. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we really are, us. you know, and especially on a topic like this, where yeah. there's a lot of people that I'm sure are interested and, and don't know where to turn. Look, yeah. the, b event space has you covered free Absolutely. education. We're always here. Um, all of these 
presentations, like all of our online content, is going to be archived. You can check that out on Facebook at uh, BNH Event Space. Night Photography Week has been archived on our YouTube channel, so be sure to check out our YouTube channel and also livestream.com backslash BH Event Space. So huge thank you to all of our viewers. Matt, special thank you for you for joining us uh, today, and you know you're always welcome back, man. Thanks, guys, as always. it's uh, I can't wait to watch some of the other viewers. It's going to be awesome from the other talks. I need to I need to catch up, that's for sure, because it, just, it was a full schedule. I know that you guys had going on. So thanks. Uh, thanks Definitely. for the effort putting it on. I know it's a lot of work. So thank you guys again. It's building a community. I think you guys are doing a great job. Ah, look, we love it. We know our viewers out there have a special love for astro and night photography. So you know, we got to give the people what they want. <laughs> so listen to them. It's perfect. Exactly. Thanks again, Derek. Nah, thank you, Matt. Sure, we'll see you back here soon on yeah, the man. virtual event space. And to all of you viewers, I hope you guys we see you guys soon. Feel free to tune in whenever we're here, Monday through Thursday. You know where to find us. That's it for today, for us, for Night Photography Week. It's been another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space.